the start that Paul gives us here with his prayer and his concerns. And I, I remember some years ago I, I preached from this and I just couldn't leave Colossians without going back to the beginning and preach on, on this, on the way Paul prayed. Now you wonder sometimes if Paul came to this meeting this afternoon and he sat here for a pre prayer meeting, how would his prayers sound like? You think they would sound like ours? We ask for prayer requests and Paul would raise his hand. What do you think you'd be asking for? Well, you don't have to guess because it's registered in Scripture. And I'd like you to open your Bibles in Colossians chapter 1, but we'll be reading verses 9 through 14. And you'll see here, it's a, there's a parallel passage in Philippians 1, verses 8 through 11, which we will read also. They kind of come together. And uh, through this, the reading here, um, I think we will understand that Paul's concern, concerns were, went beyond the physical and the material. Most of his, I would say 99% of his prayers were always focusing on spiritual understanding for the Christians, for spiritual growth, for open doors uh, to, for the gospel. So if you will, you'll join me with uh, reading uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, all the way through 14. Try to pick up what Paul is saying here. <clears throat> After the, his uh, greeting, verses 1 through 5, he goes into verse 9 and telling us what he's concerned about. He says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, did not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge, notice what his prayers were focused on, filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness giving thanks unto the father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in high who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the, the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his, body, through his blood even the forgiveness of sins if you will, just hold your place there. That's, that's where we're going to be launching our message from. But I'd like you to see a very similar prayer that he does in Philippians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Philippians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in all the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that you love that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the spirit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. When we uh, pray, how do our prayers sound like? How, how do we, when we pray for people, how do we intercede on behalf of other believers? Sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, I'm studying a career. I want to be successful. Would you please pray that I be successful? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We might pray maybe for health, uh, from, you know, health from sickness, healed, be healed from sickness. Maybe we pray for little Johnny to uh, pass his exams. There might be sunny uh, for Wendy's wedding or, you know, uh, uh, Henry's wedding uh, in a few weeks. You know, you might be praying this way. But I'll tell you one thing, you'll, be, you'll, find, it very, you'll find it very hard to sustain uh, these prayers and have a, a, a biblical backup, you know, to support these prayers with Scripture. One thing we know about prayer, the prayer must be sincere. Prayer must express the deep needs of the heart of the one praying. Prayer should be original and spontaneous. However, 
we need scripture to be able to guide our prayer life. And uh, what we see here with the Apostle Paul is precisely things, you know, the way he prays is very different from what I normally hear us praying. He prays for excellence, spiritual excellence, spiritual uh, intelligence, sabiduría, inteligencia espiritual, uh, wisdom, and spiritual understanding. Uh, knowledge, in, uh, to be filled with the knowledge of Christ. We, we see these things in his prayer. And every time you open one of his epistles, you, he starts with a longing. It's like he's, he has a same, almost the same uh, prayer request for every believer that he hears about. That they, be, they, have, they are full of God's understanding, they're full of scripture, full of, as we, we see here, spiritual understanding in the, in the Spanish translation is inteligencia espiritual, spiritual intelligence. The know-how, you know, the things that really matter. I have come across uh, believers in the years I've been a pastor who have said, Pastor, I believe in what John says in 1 John 5, 14. It says that this is uh, the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He will help us. And Pastor, I prayed for a Lamborghini and He didn't give me one. <laughs> Not maybe it wasn't a Lamborghini, but I've, I've heard things that you know, would just make you scratch your head. According to, that, you know, they forget uh, other passages where it says according to His will, he will help us. So how do we know His will? We need to get into Scripture. We need to be effectual. We need to be effective in our prayers. As James says in 5.16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's important for us to understand how to pray and what to pray for. And just to give you an example, imagine I'll just put random names. For example, Mr. Smith. He has a terrible leak in his house. I know about leaks in this, in this <laughs> church. And the last year we, uh, we've, had, uh, we've had so many, it's not even funny. You know, we have, uh, 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 you know, this Mr. Smith has terrible leaks in his house, and we're concerned for uh, their well being. So we go to God and ask Him, Lord, please give Mr. and Mrs. Smith more buckets in order to help keep uh, the house dry. Now that's not bad. More buckets, but is that what we really want? Is to keep, uh, you know, throwing the uh, water out. Sometimes when you look at, uh, at, you know, a situation like this deeper, you, you might, uh, you know, when you study a situation like this, you say, well, why do you have, they have leaks on the first hand? And you pass by, maybe you drive by their house, and you see that during the week they're throwing stones at the roof, <laughs> and they're breaking the tile. So, you go ahead and you see that and you say, well, I'll keep on praying for more buckets. So maybe you should pray that God will give us some understanding, some common sense, and stop throwing stones in the roof. You see what I mean? If we, can be pray, if we can be praying for buckets to keep the house dry, or we can go deeper and maybe pray that they have some intelligence. Don't simply stop throwing stones on your roof. Maybe you have um, a Mr. Brown. He has a tendency of, uh, you know, lighting matches and, uh, and uh, you see maybe smoke coming out of their, their house. Uh, the, and then you think, well, maybe I should uh, pray that he stops, that he, you know, that he runs out of matches, or maybe we should pray that he understands the consequences of playing with matches. You see what I mean? You, sometimes we just go to the, the, uh, the effect and not the cause. And we, when, I, when I look at Paul's prayers, uh, he, he goes deeper than just the effects. He, just, he doesn't just pray that they're, they're safe and, and uh, healthy and, uh, you know, and they are uh, just having a good life that they, they're provided for. No, no, he goes deeper. He, and we see in this, in Colossians chapter 1, several things that uh, Paul prayed for that I think we can learn from. For example, the first thing we see in chapter 1 verse 9, let's read that again. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, that if you go a few, a few verses before that, you see that he's talking about the salvation that took place through Epaphras, 
there in Colossae. The, the, there were Christians there that had just recently become saved. And Paul hears about it. And so notice what he prays. Uh, for this cause we also, since the day we heard, uh, heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Notice what he prays for. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you be filled with the knowledge of his will. Next time we meet for prayer, and I say, anybody has any prayer requests, this would be a good thing to ask for. That each of us here would have an understanding of God's will so that we can do it. Not just to be healthy and wealthy and wise and not, you know, those things that we normally pray for, but that we will have spiritual vision. Filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In Philippians 1.10 it says that ye may prove things that are excellent. Not just good. Now sometimes we just go for the good. But Paul says, no, no, we need to aim higher than that. We need to aim for the excellent things, the things that really glorify the Lord. That ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Now here in this passage we just read, let's see three things. First of all, we need to pray for spiritual wisdom. Of, I'm sorry, spiritual vision. That we know what, what we're here for and that we do it. That we understand that we're not here just to have good jobs and, and a good life and you know, living in a place like a Costa del Sol, you say, well, I have it made. It's more, you know, if you, if you live here long enough, those of you who have been living long enough, after six months, the glow disappears. You see that the coast has more than just sun. It has people who are aching, people who are, who are hurting, people who need the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are people from all over the world just coming to our, to our very doorstep that need to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. So because this is true, we need to go beyond the physical and the material. And we need to ask the Lord for us to help us have vision, to be able to look beyond, beyond our needs, beyond our circumstances. And Paul uh, mentions three things here. He says that we receive the truth, that we realize the truth, that we relate to the truth, not just that we know it, but that we actually relate. Let's pick each one of these things individually. First, that we receive the truth. If you're here this afternoon, do you Pray before you came and say, Lord, there's something this, that you have to say to me this afternoon that I really need to pay attention to, that I really need to register in my heart, and that I really need to focus on during the rest of the week. There are things that I need to change in my life, things that are hindering my service, things that are hindering my relationship with you, and even maybe the relationship we have with the people at the church. Lord, may... I receive the truth with humility. <clears throat> if you continue, we've, read, we've studied the book of Colossians, and you, you see that you know, he's praying this way because he knew that those new believers need a change. In chapter 3, verse 1 through 13, he, he talks to us about this taking off and putting on. Taking all the old things and putting on the new things. He's trying to help the Galatians understand that they're new creatures in Christ, that the old things have passed away, that they need to behold that all things have become new. When we come to church, we need to come with that attitude. Lord, there's something that you want to do away with in my life, and there's something you want to add into my life. Maybe there's wrong priorities set in our life. Uh, maybe they, they need to change. Maybe there's moral values that have to be changed. Paul talked about that in, in, in Colossians 3. Maybe habits that had to be changed. Maybe vocabulary that needed to be changed. Their ways and their habits needed to change, and they needed something to replace it. And of course, he goes into chapter 3 talking about the home, the house, the, the husband, and the wives, and everything else that, you know, where Christ needs to be, be preeminent. So we need to receive the truth. We need, to come, we need to come to church with an open heart. And then we need to realize the truth. And Paul prayed for a, a keen sense of moral and spiritual perception. And he says that you be filled with spiritual understanding, verse 9. 
Again, in the Spanish translation, it comes a little different. Intelligence. Inteligencia. If they ever made an IQ test on you, how many of you have ever had an IQ test? I don't want to ask how much you received. You got it. Um, my wife got a, a, a number that I think the machine just went wrong. It went over 160. You know, that's pretty high. If I did, I, I'm afraid to do mine because if she sees it, she'd think, she'd probably think, I knew you were lacking something. <laughs> but how about, how do you do a spiritual, a spiritual IQ test? I'm not just saying how many verses in the Bible you memorize, but how much do you understand of the scripture? There's been so many times when I've asked somebody, even in discipleship, uh, I was explaining something, we went to a passage, and they read it very clearly, and then and they read it very eloquently, and I said, okay, what does it mean? And they go, uh, and they had to read it again. There was no understanding in their mind. And they said, well, can you explain that verse to me? And after reading it two, three times, I said, I, I can't. So sometimes I wonder if I'm coming through with what I'm giving in, the, in discipleship. Sometimes I need to slow down. And it's not really their fault. It's just that they don't really have a spiritual, in, they, they're intelligent, they're, uh, their ability to understand is, is, has not been produced. So I, I need to understand what Paul is saying here. And all of us need to, again, we need to receive the truth. And we need to realize the truth. <clears throat> you know, life is very complex. And sometimes the decisions that we make, we just do it from the heart. We just don't random. You know, this is what feels good, and, and we make decisions this way. Sometimes when you come to church, or you know, when Sunday comes along, you, you might even do the same thing. Oh, I don't feel like going to church. Or I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like serving in this area. And we just do this. We have this gut instinct that's, that's carnal, and it needs to change. We need to have a spiritual instinct, an understanding of how things must uh, be. So we need to receive the truth, we need to realize the truth, and we need to relate to the truth. Paul recognized that they would need divine wisdom to choose the good in order that they might be drawn to the highest and the best. <clears throat> when I worked at the U.S. military base, I would hear some companions when we had to do something, and it was complex, and they, they would use this word that I learned later on, they said, well, just wing it. Just, just kind of get some, you know, that MacGyver tape, that American tape, that you know what I mean, and, and that fixes anything. Just, just tape it together. And you think, oh, you can't do that. That's not going to hold very long. But at least it'll work for now. With Paul, it wasn't. Let's just kind of get it fixed and keep on working. No, Paul is saying, no, no. We, we need excellence in this. We need to do it right. We need to relate to the truth. Paul there in Philippians 1 verse 10, he says, um, please come with me there. I don't have it written here. So we need to go there. Philippians chapter 1 verse 10. That ye, that ye may prove things that are... What's the word that he uses here? That you may prove things that are excellent. That ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. If you're going to do anything, do it for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have Him in mind. Do it with excellence, pleasing Him. Man has developed methods to measure, again, measure intelligence. But how do you measure uh, spiritual intelligence? In big companies, they uh, do have tests to measure your IQ. Um, most, a good average is 110 from 110 to 140. If you go beyond 140, you're, you're not normal, you're special. But how do you measure spiritual IQ? Well, we need, first of all, we need to understand Scripture. Which means that we need to spend time in it. We need to chew it, we need to, uh, um, you know, savor it. Look what it says in Philippians 4. Come with me real fast to Philippians, I'm sorry, to Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 17 through verse 24. This I say therefore and testify of the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as the other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. 
who being past uh, feeling have been have given themselves over to up to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with uh, greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, then that you put off concerning the former conversation, that is, the former behavior, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. After that, you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Um, <clears throat> quite a passage. Look at verse 24. And that you put on the man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. What is the aim of Scripture? To make us holy. Not just to make us wise, not just to make us more um, knowledgeable, that it makes us holy. If Scripture doesn't reach that purpose in your life, then we're, 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 we're not reading it properly. We need to be reading it and uh, 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 finding how this fits in every area of our life. Have you ever seen little children with, a, with that game they had, so like, a, like a box and it has all kinds of shapes, circles, squares, stars, and triangles, rectangles, and so on. And then they have pieces that they have to fit in. I've seen a little boy get a circle and try to put it in a square block with a hammer. <laughs> and you tell him, that it's not done that way. So why not? Well, it's a, you know, the, the, the square and the, and the circle don't, don't go together. <clears throat> you know, when we go to scripture, we need to understand these things. We need to know how scripture fits into every area of our life. So that we have spiritual intelligence. But I want you to see something, something else. Not just spiritual vision. Paul prays for spiritual vitality. If you go back to chapter, Colossians chapter uh, 1 verse 10, notice what that spiritual vision or inter, uh, uh, understanding is supposed to go to. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, be fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Be fruitful in every good work work. Paul prayed that uh, they might reap abundant harvest, abundant fruit, uh, as they learn from, from the Lord. He was urging them to respond to God in a manner that would enable them to bear fruit. Is that how we pray? When we pray about something, are we considering the outcome? Or are we just looking for something that will benefit us? Are we praying, Lord, please change something in my life. Help me understand these things so that you will be glorified, so that the fruit that I bring forth will be something that you can be happy about. So Paul went beyond the material and, and the physical. He prayed for spiritual vision. He prayed for spiritual vitality. And we see this, the importance of being fruitful in so many areas of different passages. The, the one that caught my attention most is John 15, the vine and the branches, the parable of the vine and the branches. There's one thing you need to uh, understand if you want to be fruitful. You need to be drawing from, from the vine. You need to have a, a very close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, allowing His Word to cleanse you so that then there will be natural fruit coming up because of that relationship. Without me, he says, you can do nothing. Without his word, there will be no cleansing, and our prayers will be unfruitful. So this spiritual vitality will affect many, many things. It will affect our walk, the, our Christian walk, the work that we do for the Lord. And it will also uh, change our interests in life. It will bring a wonder. You want more. You want something more, and you just want more and more. And then the last thing, not just spiritual vision, Paul prays for spiritual vision and spiritual vitality, but notice the last thing, spiritual victory. If you go back to Colossians 1 verse 11, it says, strengthen with all might, dynamos. That's the word, dy dynamic, that we are uh, full of dynamite, uh, full of power. Strengthen with all might. 
according to His glorious power, not our power, but something that comes because of that close relationship with Him that strengthens us. Not just some power, but all might according to the, His glorious strength, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So we need this spiritual victory. Strength, we need to be strengthened with not just some power. We don't need to come to church just to get some, you know, uh, kind of a, a quick fix, if you allow me to express it that way. You know, Pastor, just give me something that will get me through the week. Uh, I hope you don't come that way. We need to come here, as we, as we see here with Paul, to be strengthened with all might so that we can make a difference once we leave the church. And we can make a difference once we come to church, by the way. Sometimes we just come. And we sit. And we go through the message. And we leave the same way we came in. Now that's not good. If that's a situation you're going through week after week, you need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need to change my prayers. I need to change the priorities of my prayers. I need to have spiritual understanding. I need to know where I'm going, what, what the purpose for my life really is here on this earth. Lord, and I need to do this because I really want to live in victory. This was, this was Paul's prayer. The first uh, the moment that he heard from Epaphras, the results of the, of the mission work that he did over there in Colossae, he says, okay, folks, let's start praying. This is what we're going to be praying for. This is the priorities that we need to put before the Lord. Because this will affect everything else that they do. It will affect their reasoning, the way they make choices. We need that spiritual victory today. And we will see two things about this spiritual victory. <clears throat> we need to see what was the secret to this spiritual victory and what is the scope. It's secret. Paul gave the secret of his strength and his success. For example, he says, for me to live in Christ, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The secret of Paul's Success in life was that he lived Christ all the way through. And if that meant death, well, for him it was gain. And we should look at it the same way. He would also say things like, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. My source of strength, whatever the situation I'm in, if I'm free or in prison, my source always comes from the Lord. And he had tremendous joy even while he was in prison. Remember when he was taken in prison in the thing it was in uh, Ephesus were putting to, into the in the Spanish it says in lo mas profundo, lo mas hondo de la prisión, in the deepest dungeon that you could find uh, there in that prison. And you know what he and Silas was doing after a while he was in bonds, uh, locked up, dark, humid, smelly, and you know what they're doing? They're sing singing hymns with true joy in their heart. They could put them in a prison, but they could not take the joy of their heart out of, their, in, uh, out of them. And the people that were there bond in, in every possible way. They saw how free these men were. So what was their secret? Christ was everything for them. And then what was their priority? What was their scope? Uh, it was to live Christ out. When the believer makes time to learn more about his Savior, when the believer puts his life on God's altar and presents himself as a living sacrifice to do God's will in his life, when the believer loses himself and gives himself to the Lord, he will have joy, peace, and an inner strength that will pass all understanding. Look at verse 11, chapter 1, verse 11. Strengthen with all might according to this glorious power. Notice now, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness. You think we need to change our prayers? You need to, we need to make some different prayer requests and make different prayer lists. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be praying for what we're praying, but I think if we pray for those things that you know, God is interested in, we wouldn't have to be praying for a lot of things we have in our prayer list right now. 
because we will be making better choices. The Lord will be working mightily in, in our life. Now, you say, are you preaching that to us? No, I'm preaching that to me. I'm preaching that to all of us. Last week I was, uh, had a chance to pray, uh, pray with one of the brothers and I went back to the room. And I was so blessed. You know, uh, somehow I, I found myself very, in, in, a, in a very mechanical mode. And it's okay, we need to pray. And you know, I, was, I was kind of in a rush. And I, and I brought in all the prayer requests that I could think of. And I said, in Jesus Christ, name, amen. And then this other brother started praying. There was so much worship in his prayer. And that put conviction in my heart. And there was so much thankfulness, even in the condition that this brother was in. Which is not good, by the way. It was refreshing. He was focusing his attention on God Himself and His glory. Bringing that up, and once you can see that, then everything kind of falls in place. It's not about, let's go to church because we have so many prayers we need to uh, and need answer, you know, need this job, you know, housing, we need all these things. We all have needs. But you know, and, and let's present those needs to the Lord. But let's make sure we put first things first. That we put our hearts in the right place. That we put our minds, really open our minds to God's Word. That we are interested in the, in the things that God is interested in. That we don't just pray that, uh, Lord, give uh, Mr. Jones uh, more buckets so that they can draw out the water. Uh, give them intelligence so they don't break the tiles in the roof. <laughs> Help Mr. Jones not play with, the, with matches. Most of his furniture is burnt. Well, let's pray that God will give him new furniture. No, let's pray that God gives him intelligence to not be playing with matches. So many, many, many times we create our own problems. And it's because of the choices that we make. We need to put our priorities in the right place. And when all these things are placed in the right, in the right place, Again, let's look what happens. Strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power. It's His power now, flowing for us unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father, which had made us meet to be partakers of the heritage of the saints in light. Giving thanks, we, we, instead of complaining, we come with a true uh, thanksgiving. I mentioned to the Spanish group this morning if, that maybe we should have a, a service that all, it, you know, it's all focused on Thanksgiving. Just Thanksgiving, just praising the Lord for the things that He has done. How many of you would come and say, you know, I'd, I'd like to be part of a service like that where I can share the, the things that the Lord has done in my life and, and, and show that Christ is truly alive and working in my life, that he's, 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 he's well in, in, in the way he's working in my life. You know, it's been 2,000 years since Paul wrote these words, and, and they still ring very, very loud in my heart. And I hope they, they, sing, they, they sound loud in your heart. We need not just to approve good things, we need to go for the excellent things. We need to look beyond just the superficial. We need to start changing our priorities, making Christ first in every way, putting Christ at the throne of our heart. In many lives, Christ is just on the footstool, just, you know, uh, uh, kind of on, on, the, on the floor, and we have our egos on the throne. That needs to change. I don't like the word, be committed to Christ. You say, well, aren't we supposed to be committed? Of course we need to be. But that's not enough. When you say you're committed to the Lord, you have control. You decide what to give to the Lord. We should start thinking in terms of surrender. An amen, an amen will be good there. Amen. Surrender. How many times have I shared with you the story of this man called uh, Rod, uh, um famous preacher passed away a few years ago. Um, Bellevue Baptist Church. Anybody remember 
Adrian Rogers, there it is. This man traveled even to Madrid one time. He was invited by many missionaries. And in one occasion, this, this, I heard this years ago, boy, it hit me like a 10-ton hammer. He said he went to Romania. He was picked up by one of the leading pastors there. And on the way from the airport to the place where he was being lodged, he asked a few questions and said to this man, uh, tell me what kind of Christianity you have here in Romania. What kind of question is that? You know? And the pastor, understanding where he was coming from, he said, I prefer not to answer that. He said, no, come on, I'm a big boy, I can handle it. Tell me, what kind of Christianity you, 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 know, you kind of live here? And the pastor hesitated for a while, but then he said, you know, I've been in America, and I've, and I've seen, and I, and I hear the vocabulary, I, I, I hear people speaking in churches. And you tend to speak a lot about being committed. So said, yeah, well, we need to be committed, don't we? He says, yeah, but if you decide to be, I mean, we're committed in an hour and a half this afternoon. But that doesn't mean we're surrendered. You can commit five minutes to prayer, maybe half an hour to a Bible study, but that doesn't mean you're committed. We're committing, you know, portions of our day, portions of things, you know, areas that we say, yeah, I can give this to the Lord. Yeah, and then we say we're committed Christians. No, this pastor said, you tend to be thinking in terms of commitment here in Romania. We think in terms of surrender. And he explained, he says, nothing less than surrender is acceptable to an almighty sovereign God. It left Adrian Rogers speechless for a while. And he took that home and shared it with his church and then threw, threw that into one of his messages, messages. And here I am, years later, bringing it across again. I think of those words and I think, Lord, how much of my life have I really given to you? When I read those, the prayers of the Apostle Paul, I think, you know, I think maybe my prayer priority should change. Maybe I should start thinking about getting more understanding of Scripture, more application of Scripture. Maybe I should be thinking about changing my priorities. Instead of, I want to do this, Lord, please bless my, my, my goals. It's, Lord, what are your goals? And how can I be of service? How can I be there to be part of the solution? Folks, our prayers need to change. They need to be focused more on the soul, to the change in the transformation of the soul. And the work that God has called us to do wherever we are. Our prayer, the Paul's prayers were focused on things that delighted the Lord Jesus Christ. Not on things that would be a delight to Him. And whatever the cost, He was willing to pay. And, and at the end He said, you know what I'm going to get out of this? It's just tremendous joy and peace. At the end of his life, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I think it is, he says, I'm all alone. Everybody has uh, left me. Only Timothy is with me. I think Timothy or Luke, I always get confused, those two names. But he says, it's okay because Jesus was with me. To be able to do as much as the Apostle Paul did and then end up alone in a prison cell. It's just mind-boggling. But Paul didn't feel alone. In fact, he was thankful that the Lord had used them to make such a tremendous impact in his world. And when I see his prayers, when I see the content, what he's praying for, I see that we need to put our priorities right in a prayer life. Let's make sure that we change our prayers to meet the, the, the standards that we find in Scripture. Let's all stand and have a word. <clears throat> Father, we certainly need spiritual vision. We certainly need your spiritual strength, your vitality, your, dy your dynamic, your power. Because if we don't have that, we won't have spiritual victory. And our spirit in our life, as Christian life, will be savorless, aimless, just some a routine 
that kind of takes place once a week. May we change this so that you can be in the center of everything. Allow us, Lord, to understand what it means to have you uh, in a preeminent state in our life. Not just to give you a little corner of our life, not to make you in an important part of our life, but for you to be preeminent. I realized this afternoon, Lord, that I need to change some priorities. That I need to change my focus, my scope. That I need to change my prayer request instead of just being concerned about the moment that we might be interested in how others evolve, how others mature, how others are being transformed to the image of Christ. May our prayers change so that we, it focuses on that, on true changed lives. May our prayers change so that we don't think in terms of commitment, but that we think in terms of full surrender. We pray, Lord, that you will work mightily in our hearts. Help us understand where we need to be. Help us understand the things that need to change so that there is spiritual transformation. Help us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs>